Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday Bible Life today. Get your Bibles, turn to a couple of different gospel books, the book of Matthew chapter number 12 and the eighth chapter of the gospel of Luke. We're still following Jesus in his earthly ministry. We're in the first half of his earthly ministry. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we have gone and looked at the uh, or brought to a close our study of the Sermon on the Mount and then him going back to the area of Capernaum and we'll be seeing that he's going to lots of other cities this week in the passage that we're going to read and uh, we're going to be introduced to uh, this lady named Mary Magdalene I believe what would be the first time that we have read her name and uh, we're going to see him healing a demoniac and also then being confronted by some religious leaders who try to say that the reason that Jesus is able to cast out demons and do these things is because of by the prince of the ruler of the demons. It's going to lead us up into entering into uh, the unpardonable sin discussion towards the end of our time today and set a foundation for us looking at the kingdom parables starting next week. So if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, first the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 18. I have a subheading in this portion of my study Bible that says, Certain Women Minister to Jesus. And I'm going to begin reading uh, in verse 1 of Luke chapter 8. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So I think, as I said, this is the first mention that we have had of Mary Magdalene. If you've been fortunate enough to watch some of the episodes, especially season one of The Chosen, uh, our church family is now preparing this coming Sunday to watch the last episode, see, uh, episode number eight of season two. But if you've watched the episodes in the first season of The Chosen, you will have no doubt uh, seen the episode where Jesus cast the demons out of Mary and healed her. And that was early on in his ministry as it was presented in the Chosen series. And so it's a little bit different uh, than what we find here in the chronology of Mary's name being mentioned. Although this particular passage doesn't necessarily mean that she hasn't been with him or healed for a while, but I believe it's the first time we've read her name. So then we read of these other women, and this word other, there are uh, a couple of different Greek words that are used for other or another, and one of them, which this particular one is, is the Greek word heteros. That means another of a different kind. The other Greek word that's used for another or other is alos, which means another of the same kind. So where it says here uh, that out of whom come seven demons and Joanna, the wife of Cusa and so forth and Susan and many others who provided for him, that word others there is this Greek word heteros, meaning others of a different kind. So we don't know that those others were whether they were men that helped and provided for the needs of the group, or if they were other women. But it was other people who followed along in Jesus' group that uh, would be, have been disciples, in addition to the 12 that we refer to as apostles. And it says here that they provided for him from their substance. So uh, I think that it's interesting that God has provided bountifully for these particular people, whoever those others were, for their blessing 
and also had them in the right place at the right time to join Jesus group and to be able to provide for the needs of that group. It's amazing to me as we read through scripture how many times God has something or some person that's an absolute necessity for the need of the moment right there, Johnny, on the spot, just at the correct time. Kind of amazing how that works. So now we'll move to Matthew chapter number 12, and I'll begin reading at verse 22 if you'd like to turn there. We're going to read about uh, a healing and a consequent uh, confrontation by the religious leaders that results in Jesus teaching about this unpardonable sin, and we'll have some things to say about that. And we find these accounts mentioned in two of the Gospels. The first one we'll read, as I said, is from Matthew chapter 12. The second one is from Mark chapter number 3. So I'll begin reading in Mark 12, 22 through 30. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spake and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed, saying, Could this be the son of David? And that is a messianic phrase or term, meaning the Messiah, the son of David. Kind of the same way that the son of man is a messianic term. Verse 24 says, Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons, except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts. In other words, they didn't say this out loud. They thought it in their mind. Like other times that we've seen Jesus respond to the thoughts that the Pharisees and the scribes had even before they verbalized them. And that's the situation here. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And now we'll read the account of this from Mark's Gospel, chapter number 3, verses 20 through 27. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. So he called them to himself, that's Jesus, and he said to them in parables, or a word picture, or a story that will have a spiritual meaning to it. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. So this particular uh, passage, or a couple of passages, gives rise to that saying, a house divided cannot stand. It's a little bit similar in our day. We might put it in a sports metaphor. We might say that a, a team that doesn't have good chemistry can't win ball games. Here, in a spiritual sense, he's being accused of performing miracles and casting out demons by the power of the ruler of the demons. 
And Jesus is saying, what you're saying is ridiculous because it would be Satan casting out his own people if I'm doing this by the power of the ruler of the demons, Beelzebub. So the subheadings in both of these accounts are man-made and they're not uh, inspired by the scripture itself. And so when it says a house divided cannot stand, that's a man-made subheading. And so that's what Jesus is basically telling them, however. This passage indicates that these religious leaders were familiar with who the ruler of the demons was. They even seemed to know his name, Beelzebub. That kind of causes some question in my mind. How did they know that? This is an interesting accusation by these religious leaders, although it was apparently only by their thoughts, and Jesus, as I mentioned, knew their thoughts and responded to them before they verbalized it. Maybe they were getting frustrated by all the miracles that he had been doing. Maybe they felt threatened because they couldn't do that. Or maybe they were just trying to say anything that they could to get people from believing in him and following him. They probably felt threatened. And Jesus responded to what they were thinking with the familiar phrase, a house divided cannot stand. And so now Jesus is going to translate this confrontation into him speaking about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which he refers to as the unpardonable sin. And we'll read these passages and then have some comments about that. Matthew chapter 12 verse 31 and 32. Jesus speaking. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that was referring to himself, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. And now I'll read Mark's account of this, what Jesus said from Mark chapter 3, verses 28 through 30. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemes they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. This unpardonable sin, many people are familiar with the phrase, the unpardonable sin, and some people are worried about it. I've heard people ask questions about it for fear that they had committed it and their hope for eternal salvation may be being lost. And, uh, so I think that sometimes people uh, don't understand or maybe it's misrepresented to them. I don't believe that anyone who is worried about having committed the unpardonable sin has committed that. I think that anybody who's living and is concerned about their eternal salvation and where they're going to spend eternity and they are, have that, that concern, they certainly have not committed the unpardonable sin, at least not yet. The context of this passage, I believe that Jesus was empowered by the Spirit of God to do these miraculous things that he did, and this in particular instance, cast out a demon and heal his blindness. Um, they were accusing him of doing these things through the power of demons or the ruler of the demons. And this is one place in Scripture where Jesus speaks up in defense of the Holy Spirit. He even said that blaspheming him or speaking against him would be forgiven. But speaking against the Holy Spirit and blaspheming against him would not be forgiven. And we learn from Scripture <clears throat> that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify God the Son, Jesus Christ, and to call men to salvation by believing in Jesus and totally depending upon him and what he did on the cross as a final and complete and finished work and payment for our sin debt if we will just trust and believe in him. 
So in my opinion, in our day and age, the way a person would commit the unpardonable sin would be to not believe in Jesus as their Savior and God's Son because it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to burden our hearts that we might know and feel that we need salvation in the first place. He's the one that puts it in our heart and basically calls us to come to the Lord in salvation. So if a person shuns that calling and uh, uh, wooing, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit to our hearts to burden us to ask for forgiveness for our sins, if we spurn that and don't do that, that would be like denying the opportunity that the Holy Spirit has presented to us. And so the only sin I believe in our day that would be unforgivable is unbelief in Christ as our Savior. And that would be, I think, how a person would blaspheme the Holy Spirit, uh, deny what he has to say and what he is trying to get us to do. Well, then Jesus is going to change this, or not change, but move this idea into the idea of a fruit tree and the various kinds of fruit that a tree might produce. And in Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, there's a subheading that says, a tree is known by its fruit. And uh, I'll begin reading at Matthew 12, 33. Jesus is continuing to speak after he mentioned to them about this unpardonable sin of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. In verse 33 of Matthew 12, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. You and I are going to be used in this metaphor by our fruit. Just like this tree, it'll either produce good fruit or bad fruit. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That reminds me of what Paul had to say in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When we confess that we believe in Christ as our Savior, the words that come out of our mouth come from our heart and indicate that we have believed and trusted in Christ as our Savior, and those represent our being saved. And then he says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Well, concerning this word picture about a tree bearing fruit, either good fruit or bad fruit, Jesus was using this as a parable against the scoffing unbelievers, the religious leaders, to point out that if they were a good tree, they would produce good fruit. But since they're scoffing and unbelieving and making false accusations against Jesus and the the, as the Son of God and against the Holy Spirit's empowering him, then they proved their lost condition and the fact that they produce bad fruit. And he compares with what comes out of a man's mouth represents either good or bad fruit. We'll come to a time in the near future where Jesus will be speaking to people when they accuse him and the apostles of not following the religious rules and regulations and traditions of washing their hands and eating things that would cause them to be unclean. And he'll basically tell them, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, because what goes into the mouth goes out through the draught. But what comes out of a man's mouth, that's what defiles a man, because what comes out of a man's mouth comes from his heart, and it, it relays what his thoughts are and what the true person is like. So what comes out of his mouth is what would maybe 
defiled a man. This discourse and this confrontation that Jesus has had with these religious leaders uh, is followed up in Matthew's gospel by the scribes and the Pharisees asking Jesus for a sign to prove that he's who he claims he is, who his true identity is. And yet he's been doing miraculous signs and healing people and doing tremendous works uh, for quite some time now. And so either they're just oblivious to it or they don't accept it or they don't want to believe him or something like that. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 45. Subheading in my study Bible says, the scribes and Pharisees ask for a sign. And I like this because he's going to give them a sign. It's going to go all the way back to the Old Testament, to that guy that took a water taxi ride, Jonah, uh, who tried to get away from God's instruction on his ministry. And instead of going north and east to Nineveh from where he was, he got a ticket on a boat headed west until God changed his direction and uh, spent three days in a, a fish. So verse 38 of Matthew chapter 12. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Then he said, the queen, of the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. So a short request by the scribes and Pharisees received a longer answer from Jesus that reveals several things to us. First of all, Jesus had been doing miracles that weren't accepted or believed by these scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders. We learned that an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. When we get farther down the road in our journey and we get into some of Paul's writings in his epistles, he will make a statement that's quite interesting. He will say the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And what he's going to point out is that both of them are going about it wrong. But then back to this parable and this metaphor here, the sign Jesus shared with them was a typology. This story and this uh, sign of Jonah was a typology of Christ. Jonah was buried in the fish in the sea for three days. Jesus said he will be buried in the center of the earth for three days, or in Hades. The people of Nineveh, that's where Jonah was sent to preach a judgment message. And Nineveh was such a large place that the Bible said it took three days for him to walk through the city. And as he would walk, he would preach 40 days and judgment's coming. As the Baptist would say, he didn't even give an altar call. All he said was that there's judgment coming. And yet we find that God moved the hearts of those people and every one of those people in the city of Nineveh, from the poorest pauper to the rich king, all repented and said that they sat in uh, sackcloth and ashes. And Jonah even got upset with God because judgment didn't come in 40 days. And God was showing Jonah that he has mercy on the unbelieving people. And his love requires that he gave an opportunity for salvation to those people. So it was quite an object lesson to Jonah. Here, Jonah is being used by Jesus as an object lesson to these scoffers that he'll be in the center of the earth for three days like Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days. 
Well, then he said that the people of Nineveh repented and they showed that they had more belief and faith in what Jonah said than these people had, even though they'd seen Jesus perform miracles and listened to what he had to say. And he said that he was much greater than Jonah. Then he mentioned this queen of the south that came to visit and to listen to Solomon that we read about back in the Old Testament. The queen of the south showed greater interest and faith to hear what Solomon had to say and believed it than these guys did to hear and to believe what Jesus had to say. And Jesus is greater than Jonah. He's greater than Solomon. So the things that we've seen today have laid quite a background and quite a foundation for our looking into the kingdom parables that will begin next week in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew. It's not been too awfully long ago, or maybe I guess it may have been a year ago by now. I lose track of time. But I know that in this particular series of Thursday Morning Bible Life today, we've gone through the parables. I think we discovered there were 42 of them. And we're not going to go through all of them next week. We're going to look at some next week beginning that are referred to as the kingdom parables. And I believe that represents a period of time from the time when Jesus ascended until he comes back again to set up his kingdom. And we'll find those in Matthew chapter 13. And all the things that went about in what we looked at today have set a foundation for us to read through and get a grasp on what those parables are trying to tell us. And that's where we'll be next week if you'd like to read ahead, Matthew chapter 13. Father, thank you so much for the blessings you've given. Thank you for your word. Thank you for those who join us online. I ask for your great blessings upon them, on their families and their homes, that you would keep them safe and in good health. We ask that you would bless all of us as we go through these studies in your word, that we be both encouraged and strengthened as your servants and as your children. Thank you for the promises that you give in your word. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. I hope you all have a great weekend. I hope that you recover from the cold and bad weather and that we get into some better weather. You know, spring's coming. I'm looking forward to it. Until next week, Lord bless you.